Good evening, I'm Brett Premack. I wanna welcome you to Sunday Night Live. Tonight's show is about a man I consider a jazz hero. In fact, many people consider him a jazz hero. He's a wonderful saxophone player. He's an educator who has touched the lives of many, many people and helped them. And he produces one of the hippest jazz festivals I've ever been to. It's called the Mid-Atlantic Jazz Festival. Tonight, we're gonna to be getting into the world of Paul Carr. Paul, welcome to the show. How you doing, Brett? Uh, thanks a lot, thanks for having me. Well, it's, it's an honor. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. And uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Paul is joining us from a, uh, a dark room underneath the New York subway, <laughs> which is why he's so dark. Uh, <laughs> oh, hey. What happened? You got bright all of a sudden. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's trying to. It's, yeah. Well, anyway, we had a couple of uh, had, had a couple of hitches right at the at the start of the show, so I'm on a different computer. So maybe that might have something to do with it. Okay. Well, it's the spirit that counts. Right. And uh, live with us in the studio here tonight are uh, two people that uh, are going to testify about Paul Carr. <laughs> uh, Bruce Barth is a pianist uh, in and around New York, plays with a lot of great cats, and he's done a lot of work with Paul. Bruce, how are you tonight? I'm fine, Brett. Greetings to Paul and Angel. I'm very happy to be part of this because um, I just, it's great to have a chance to, you know, pay tribute to Paul because I love his musicianship and he's just, uh, uh, he's what we call him a giver. He gives to so many people. He's given to so many people and he continues to do so. And it's always a joy playing with him. So on many levels, I, and I've played at Paul, I've played at your festival many times. So just to say thank you for all that you do. So thank you. Here. Yeah. Thank also, you, Bruce. And also uh, in the house tonight is one of Paul's students, a tenor saxophonist, Angel McRae. Hey, Angel, glad, glad to see your face in the place. Yes, of course. It's uh, great to be here. Um, when Mr. Carr messaged me, I was a little surprised. I wasn't expecting to be on here, but it's a great honor. Um, I've learned so much from him, and I've just grown so much since the first time um, I had a lesson. So it's great to be able to have a conversation on here. And uh, we also have uh, some people who, unfortunately, are working tonight. I shouldn't say unfortunately, because anytime you work, it's a good thing. Yes. But... Uh, they weren't able to join us, but uh, I, I did some pre-interviews, and the first we're going to be looking at here, and then we'll talk about it, is Brantford Marcellus, who's a very good friend of Paul's for many, many years. He's a lot mm -hmm. like me. He uh, strives to get better every year. I mean, you know, he uh, identifies his weaknesses, and he does things to address them. Uh, some people tend to want to focus on their strengths, and dismiss the importance of addressing weaknesses and some people understand that growth is about addressing your weaknesses <laughs> not about doubling down on your strengths a lot of musicians are smart enough to hear that their records are starting to sound a lot like the prior records so uh, the quick fix solution is to just keep changing groups <laughs> <laughs> so one record's a quartet, the next record's an organ trio, the next record's a big band. You just keep changing the context. And that tends to be kind of like a mask for the repetitive nature of, of uh, some players' philosophy. People tend to not hear with a certain level of specificity. So if you change the context of a group, people tend not to notice, oh, man, that's the same solo you played on the last record. <laughs> this is, you, you tend not to notice that because the context is, is, is changed, which is a smart way to go about it if, if you're really not interested in, in addressing your limitations. I mean, yeah, that's what I would do. My endeavor is always to become a better musician, not a better saxophone player. When you are lucky enough to play for audiences that aren't musicians, they respond to sound because they don't really know or care about how technically advanced you're playing your instrument. Uh, that would be impressive on one song. 
but two or three songs, it gets to be boring very quickly. So what I had to do was just as a, as a younger person, when I was playing this burnout style, I didn't really realize at the time, yeah, people get burnt out on the burnout after the second song. <laughs> so then I had to learn how to play melodies better, learn how to play with more sonic variety. I had to learn how to play ballads. I had to learn how to play slow tempos. And the I think the overwhelming majority of musicians who play jazz now, they they're their idea of, of, of success in music is, is they express the music through their instrument. Uh, I try to express music through music. So uh, you have to listen to a lot of styles of music that are foreign to you. I mean, as a, as a, to a man, I mean, the guys in the band, uh, once everybody started listening to classical music more then the group kind of evolved into more of a chamber group than a traditional jazz group where you know i play then you play then the other guy plays and then we play the head at the end paul what are your thoughts on you've been out here on the scene for a while now uh you came up in houston learned from a lot of the masters down there uh as an artist as a saxophone player as a musician how do you move forward well, it's, it's pretty much basically like, you know, what Brian was saying is like you, you, you move from a, you know, you move forward by, by addressing, you know, the sound and what it, you know, what, uh, you know, of course your sound and then, you know, what the group, uh, what the group sound is or the, or the, or the, you know, the, or the music that you're playing, your music that you're writing or the music that you're playing, everything you play doesn't have to be your, uh, uh, doesn't have to be your tune. It just, you know, you just, it needs to, uh, it needs to, to, to be, to, to fit in, into whatever you are doing at that, at the time. So, uh, so that's, you know, I really, you know, I really believe, you know, believe in that. And what I was, what I was, I was laughing a couple of times when, when Brent that, you know, that was when he was talking because it's, you know, that's so him. I mean, that was, that's the way he, um, you know that's the you know uh, that that's the way he operates. And if I could just comment on a couple couple of things that he that he that he that he said, it was just like when I um I I played when when he came to the, the when his group came to the festival uh, the Mid Atlantic Jazz Festival in 2019. Uh, I I get on him all the I just I'm, I'm you know well we raz each other you know about all kinds of stuff it, anything, a lot of it's nonsense. But uh, most of the time, so he he'll call me. And he'll play some hard passage that he's practicing on classical music. And so I always say, man, why are you practicing this classical classical music? You can just you can just, you know, sit back and be Branford Marcellus. You don't have to do this. Here. You know, what, what, what are you doing this for? I mean, I, if I was doing it, I wouldn't have to practice as much as that. So it came in to be a challenge. So uh, at the uh, um, uh, so at, at the 2019 when he came, I played a uh, we we played a duet um, uh, uh, Paganini lost and it was I was just scared to death from the beginning <laughs> to the end and he did that just to show me uh, 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 about you know how hard it was but I'm gonna tell you I practiced I don't know I think I practiced six months straight <laughs> every I don't think I missed a day and I uh, you know it's really you know, uh, I really improved at that at that at that time, and um, I, I'm probably not answering your answering your question. But the thing about you know Bradford putting himself and and through through you know playing classical music and all this and you know and, and other types of music, listening to other type of music is because it definitely challenges you in different things. See, in jazz, you know, you could you could just pick a certain period and or you could just write tunes that that um. Uh, you know that you know that that reinforces your strength or you can just play a certain few tunes and but when you play when you when you challenge yourself and play other types of music you know via classical or whatever it is it uh it and now it makes you have to address certain things in your playing so, so anyway i don't sound exactly the same there's a there's, there's a disconnect i was talking to some students at a master class not long ago because there was a a quote I made saying giant steps isn't really music, it's 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 math. 
And uh, I said, well, it, it, it really is math. I mean, Coltrane worked on it for two and a half years and then he left it. And I don't think he left it because he wanted us to still be talking about it 60 years later. He did what he did with it and then he moved on from it and whatever he learned from it, he took it with him and then he started the quartet. But you can go to YouTube, as you brought it up, and type in Giant Steps and find multitudes of 15, 16 year old kids playing Giant Steps. But you don't hear any of those kids playing slow blueses or ballads or anything from a Love Supreme or anything, because that requires a different, it requires a, a, a musical skill set in addition to a technical skill set. And uh, one of the guys said, well, what's wrong with 15 year, old, 15 year olds playing Giant Steps? I said, when, when the guy who invented Giant Steps was 15 years old, he was listening to 30 swing tunes. That's what 30 swing tunes can get you to. Giant Steps on its own, out of context, with all, all the stuff that created it, it just becomes a theoretical exercise. And that's what it sounds like when everybody plays it. Uh, they'd learn, you know, when you, 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 it's, it's when I had the, was blessed enough to talk to a lot of the dinosaurs before they left the earth. When, you know, when I was talking to Blakey or Dizzy or uh, Getz or any of those guys, it was all about the music that they grew up listening to and how much it had an impact. And they all highly recommended that I should start listening to this stuff. And they were right, but for every one person like me that would do it, there's a hundred who say, man, I don't wanna to listen to that old crap, man. I'm young and I wanna forge ahead and start my new thing. And, you know, the thing, the magic in music is sound, but the the, the reality is like for a lot of people that play in jazz now, uh, the, 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 the magic in music is in data. And unfortunately for them, data does not have a sound. And since they don't really spend much time thinking about sound or working about on sound, when you have a bunch of musicians playing patterns, I mean, how can it not sound the same? Mm -hmm. Like if you listen to a record from the thirties, trumpet solos don't even sound like saxophone solos. They just play a trumpet players played a different way back then. You know, bass, bass solos didn't sound like saxophone solos. Uh, now, you know, everybody's playing like the same ideas. So all the solos tend to sound the same and the songs go to the same place emotionally, which is the really the, 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 the worst part about it. Yeah. That emotionally all the songs go to the same place because the goal in playing jazz now isn't playing to the people. It isn't playing for the people. It isn't swinging. It's basically soloing. So everybody's thinking about their solo. Everybody wants to identify with like train toward the end of his life when he was really out there when he played I want to talk about you and played a million notes in it. Everybody like wanted to do that. Nobody wanted to do a, a, that other thing. It's like Coltrane could play ballads beautifully. I mean, you listen to him playing with Johnny Hartman. You listen to him playing on the ballads record. You listen to him playing with Bellington. Man, he's a beautiful player. But that the attraction was this technical monstrosity that 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 he created, and that became the attraction. Paul, you work with a lot of young people who are trying to develop their individual voices. What's your reaction to what Branford just said? So I agree with it hundred percent. And just uh, yesterday, I had a a, a parent um, mother says these in person lessons are not even that you know they don't even compare to the uh, online lessons because this the student i taught him mostly all through the pandemic online and now because of scheduling uh and the convenience he has still we, we're still taking lessons online so yesterday he had a lesson in person and his mother saw the difference she could hear the difference she's not a musician so uh it's it's the uh it's it, it's because of when you when you know when you're online you have to give you know you have to you know you have to you have to approach music just pretty much like um what Bramford is talking about where you're passing out stuff and you know learn this scale or learn this chord progression or learn this arpeggio 
<coughs> excuse me. But when you get in person, we, <coughs> excuse me, we can have the back and forth. I can play. Uh, you can play. We can talk about it. So, so I agree with I agree with what he what he was saying. <coughs> Bruce, you came up at a time when when a lot of the masters that uh, Brentford uh, was alluding to were still around. In fact, you played with a master by the name of Stanley Turrentine. Uh, what did he pass on to you musically? You're a young man playing with a master like that. What did you learn? You know, I, I felt fortunate. Um, I played with Stanley as well as Art Farmer, Freddie Hubbard. So a lot of, and others from that generation. And the thing that's interesting about Stanley Turrentine, he never said a word to me about the music. I knew his repertoire. And um, it was just getting the feeling of the music, that the beautiful sound, you know, coming back to that whole topic of sound, you know, and uh, the sound and the feel, it, like, the feeling of jazz, you know, the phrasing, the swing feel, all that stuff was so beautiful. So there was no talk. He just gave us the freedom to play. And uh, he was so bad, he didn't, you know, I like the style of, you know, some people call it the Miles Davis school of band leading, not that Stanley got it from Miles, but you you hire cats you admire and you trust and you cut them loose. Paul's that same way. Paul just, he trusts the musicians. He hires musicians he wants <laughs> to do. And, um, you know, playing, playing in Paul's band, he, I mean, of course, he'll say if there's specific things about the form, certain aspects of the music but in terms of letting you just play you know <laughs> and i've certainly been in other bands where the leader has things to instruct you on and a lot of times the more talking you do the more cats are thinking about what they're playing as opposed to just listening and reacting in the moment so so i really i appreciate paul's style of a band leader and it's certainly the way I like to lead, lead a band as well, you know, and I, I might just add one thing and that's sometimes if I'm going to um, perform music with uh, different cats than the ones on the record, I'll just send them a tape of me playing those songs. If they're, let's say they're original compositions, I'd rather send the recording of me playing them so they can just hear the song, how it goes. And I want to hear what they do. I don't want them to think, oh, someone's going to play it this way on the record. So that's what I have to do. So that's kind of kind of an extension of that, I think, that philosophy of leading a band. You know, so I, I got that certainly from older cats, you know. Yeah. Now, Paul, play, being a musician, playing this music is a, a very serious commitment. Yet at a certain point... <laughs> you began to blossom as an educator. How did you get into the jazz education thing? And for those of us, for those of our viewers who don't know what you've done in jazz education, please talk about the jazz camp and the jazz academy. Well, um, I started the jazz academy in 2002, to, yeah, 2002, 2003, I think we had the first camp. And the reason why I started it is because I had a lot of students. I was teaching privately and, and uh, uh, you know, at my home. I actually started teaching in college uh, when uh, my my uh, saxophone teacher, and she was a classical saxophone teacher, the best, best, best teacher, best thing I could have had, you know, could have done for me at that period of my uh, life. And she was teaching some sixth graders out in uh, Spring, Texas. And one day she said, uh, have you ever taught before? And I said, no. And she says, well, could you could you work for me tomorrow night? I'm working in Spring, Texas, and I have some sixth graders. They, you know, and they're they're OK and da 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 da. And she she basically had three days. I thought it was one day, but she had three nights of them. You know, that lets you know how 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 uh, verose the, the band program is down in down in, 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 in Texas, down in the south. And so, uh, and so, I, I I taught the I taught the clay. It was you know all private lessons. I think it might have been about fifty of them over three days. It was it was a lot of them. I don't remember. And then uh, when I it was time for my lesson, and I came back, and she asked me, "How did the teaching go?" 
And she said, uh, I had, she asked me how did the teaching go? I said, it went fine. It was, it was good. I had a couple of, had a couple of no shows, but for the most part, it was pretty good. She says, well, they like you a lot more than me. Can you, can you do it for the rest of the year? <laughs> Damn, Paul. Yeah, that's exactly, that's what you said. She, and this was like, I don't know, maybe in, um, January. I mean, I mean, it was, I mean, it was, you know, I did like half a year, you know, half a year. She, she, had, she did, didn't want to teach, uh, um, uh, you know, she didn't want to teach it. And it was middle school, you know, so all of the, n- none of that stuff, you know, bought, you know, it kind of rolls off me. Uh, uh, Angel will, will, will attest to that. So, um, and so, and I, the thing about it was I liked having my horn in my hand at the same time I was talking about music because it was just <clears throat> reinforcing stuff that, you know, I thought I knew, or I should have, you know, I should know. And then talking about something that I thought I knew another type of way to try to convey it to students. So the whole thing just really, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I really liked it. And then I had another student, I took an a, a older student of hers to, uh, and uh, her name um, is St- uh, Stephanie Sanders. She's actually the band director now down at Norfolk State University. So uh, she was like my first, you know, like high school student, you know, uh, that I that I was teaching. And um, so that's how, you know, that's how I got into it. And then (laughs) fast forward to, you know, Maryland, I'm teaching in my basement and I'm noticing that all of these kids that I'm teaching, they they are they try out for their high school band and they didn't get in the band because of, you know, maybe because of um, seniority. You know, so I, I might have someone in a ninth grade who actually could outplay a 12th grader or, a, you know, a 10th grade could outplay. But because of the 12th grade had been there so long, uh, that person would be in the band. And this kept happening over and over again. And uh, so I said, you know what, maybe I should create something so that the kids have somewhere to play. You know, the kid, you know, the kids that I teach. So uh, the first year we started with about, you know, 20 kids and 14 of them were saxophone players, my students. And then the next year, it just just started to grow from there. So that's how I got into the Jazz Academy. Later, we started doing the uh, all year uh, ensembles, the orchestra, and the uh, and the ensemble. But that's how I, you know, that that's how I got. And it always just seemed like if I can, you know, if I can, you know, uh, you know, talk about music and play at the same time, or just talk about music and help help explain it, it, it's really it's really explaining something in a way that connects with or resonate with a with the with another individual because everybody you know you got to find that right little key little thing to do or say to like boom to make them uh uh to make them connect or to make the light bulb come on you know that type of thing so that's what i really like about it you know this is really intriguing to me well it's intriguing also to your many students over the years, Paul, and we're lucky today to have one of your current students with us, Angel McCray. Angel, you're a tennis, te- tenor saxophone player. Yes. Please talk to me, or talk to us about uh, how you found Paul and the experience of having Paul as a teacher. Well, uh, I found the Jazz Academy in general kind of out of coincidence. Um, it was my first year playing tenor, and my band director uh, sent my mom a flyer about the Jazz Academy uh, camp. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. So I signed up for the scholarship. I got the scholarship. And um, when I first started playing, I was very shy. Um, but going off of what Mr. Carr said, like he explains stuff that resonates with people, even me, like a shy little 12 year old. Um, like the way he engages with the students, it really helps like get into the music. Um, and I didn't actually start taking lessons with him until I think a year, year and a half later uh, when I was in the Jazz Academy ensemble. And uh, having those private lessons like in person really just helped me develop. Um, going off of that idea earlier, like sound, that's still my main focus, like sound and playing for others and listening. Um, and the way he engages with that and going back and forth and I play off of him and then learn from that and also listen. Um, it really just brings a lot to my playing and the way he teaches, it's just, like I said before, like it's, it's fascinating. Um, it, the way I wouldn't even be able to think like a year or two back that I'd be as confident as I am now, my sound and my playing 
if it weren't for how he approaches like his teaching style, um, it really can transform like someone's perspective and idea of just music in general. And it really just brings a lot of the emotion that is like seen in the origins of jazz and music in general. And it's really amazing to see. Now, I'm very curious about your interest in jazz, Angel. You know, when we think of young people, unfortunately, not enough know about jazz. How did you get turned down to the music and why do you like it? Um, I got into it, one, because my parents, they listen to a lot of uh, jazz and go-go music, just Black American music in general. So when I was younger at like family events and other stuff, I just hear it and I wouldn't really like know what it is, but I'd be like, oh, this is cool. But when I went into the Jazz Academy, I found like how much I liked it myself. And I think my favorite part about jazz is like it's ver variety. Um, from ballads to Afro-Cuban to like crazy 300 BPM songs. Um, you can find like any jazz song really and just correlate it to emotion you're feeling. Like, oh, I feel like this one day I'll listen to some Dexter Gordon or I'll listen to some Woody Shaw. Like there's, there's like so much variety. And I think that's what made me connect to it more because uh, through the music, I was able to relate emotionally, and that's what really helped me as a player as well. well. I think that's the key, relate to it emotionally, and it's helped you in that way. Mm. Got some other students who are going to testify here. Uh, a couple of young gentlemen who are making a name in the New York area who are attached to the Great American Songbook. I'm very happy about that. Let's uh, see what they have to say. The Andersons. Had um, many different teachers in the D.C. area. Um, and, you know, a lot of really great teachers. Eventually, when we got into high school, our teachers told us there's, there's one guy who you really need to study with. He teaches all the best players. He brings them on gigs. He really trains them to be professionals, and that's Paul Carr. So it was kind of like uh, an obvious choice um, to study with Paul. And so when we felt like we were ready, I think in the ninth grade, we started studying with him because... You know, not not everyone can study with Paul. He's got like a, a waiting list for students. So um, as soon as we got into his rotation, we were really, really thrilled. Well, oh. our, our lessons with Paul kind of predated his whole Jazz Academy. I mean, yeah. uh, when we were studying with Paul, it was just, um, there was just like a line of students uh, that took lessons in his basement. And a lot of them had great <laughs> reputation. It, it wasn't until we left uh, for New York that Paul really ramped up his education, started the Jazz Academy, started being the director of the East Coast Jazz Festival, now the Mid-Atlantic Jazz Festival. But, th but through Paul, um, we've been able to return to, uh, to the area and, and be guest clinicians at the summer camp. Um, and you know, just get involved with all the edu great educational stuff he's doing. Paul, like, he, he, he's lear learned music in a very unique way. Um, you know, jazz is, is the type of music that you really have to learn by ear. And it's, it's like a tradition. It's almost like a trade. You know, when you have an apprenticeship, when you're learning to be an electrician or a plumber, you, you apprentice. And being a good jazz player is, is like that. Um, so, you know, Paul's learned was from Texas and learned, you know, uh, from a lot of great players down there, like the, the, the style of, of the American blues and, and all this great language and um, style, like in players like Gene Ammons and uh, Dexter Gordon. And he teaches in a way where he plays and you try to play it back. Uh, he, he's not one of these guys that, that, that gives you uh, a, you know, a textbook <laughs> With, with, with scales and notes and makes you learn in a certain way. He just plays something and sees if you can play it back. His lessons are very interactive where you're constantly playing back and forth with each other, just like you would learn a language. Like if you were studying German or Japanese, you'd, you'd wanna talk to someone who's an expert at that language and just go back and forth. And, and that's the way Paul teaches. One, one of the main things I liked about Paul too is in addition to his lessons, um, Paul started inviting us to perform with him in, in his live concerts. 
So, you know, he would have uh, a gig at a jazz festival and he would have us play with him at the jazz festival. Um, he organized a show at Blues Alley and he had us play at Blues Alley with him. Um, he uh, actually invited us to play with him at a performance at the White House. Um, so he was always putting us into kind of like stressful, uh, uncomfortable situations to really pressure us to play like at the next level. So there was always <laughs> something going on with something coming up like, you know, okay, next month you guys are going to play at the, at the Mid-Atlantic Jazz Festival. So we we're always like working on something, you know, working on this song, um, just playing with professionals. He knows all the best rhythm sections in the area. So he'd always be inviting them to play with us. So he really kind of, um, you know, forced us to be in all these different professional situations before we'd moved to New York. So that was really valuable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. it's all by himself. I mean, he didn't work inside of an established institution. I mean, he started jazz camp 20, 25 years ago, 30 years ago. And he came up with this idea of starting a jazz camp for kids. And it's it's wildly successful and he's done he's done a great job. I mean, the reality is the majority of those kids are not going to become professional players, but I have believed for a long time that what we need in jazz are people who uh, have a relationship with the music and support the music, 
but are not necessarily musicians. Uh, what Paul's doing is creating a certain kind of future advocacy for jazz by getting these kids to play jazz who go on to do other things and they have fine memories of working with Paul. So sometimes they can donate to a jazz organization or a jazz institution, or even just come to the concert. At least they know it ex exists now. Whereas there were a lot of kids growing up when I was growing up, they didn't even know what jazz was. And there's still kids that don't, but what, what he's doing and what my brother's doing in New York and what some guys are doing in Philadelphia, uh, Justin Faulkner's starting an initiative in Philadelphia. I, I think that that's great for that reason, because players eventually find their way. And the my well, I did play with our Blakey, but my apprenticeship came through recordings, because everything you need to know about great musicians and why they're great, they left us a legacy of this stuff that uh, can teach us everything if we choose to listen carefully enough. Carr was my brother's tenor saxophone teacher when he was in high school. And when I was in like sixth grade, I, I became aware of Paul Carr and, um, and I got into it and I wanted to get to know him. And Paul started the, uh, the jazz Academy orchestra. And the first year it started, I auditioned and, uh, I didn't get in. And then, um, like a month later, one of the drummers had to quit because he was doing all state jazz band or something. I got to be a part of the the uh, orchestra and I just got I just got my butt kicked so hard. Like Paul yelled at me every class. I was like the one of the weakest people, you know, it was just like the tempos and stuff. And, and I just practiced and kept practicing. And eventually that guy graduated and, you know, Paul and I got pretty close and he started calling me for gigs. I started teaching at his camp, which I, I, since, since the pandemic, I haven't been doing, but I taught at it for probably 10 years and I did the sleepover camp every year and the combo instructor and taught drum lessons. And, um, and Paul has always been just so giving and, um, always, he's always been helping me out and doing great things for me and inspiring me and hipping me to musicians and albums and drummers. And I have all these students that I taught at Paul's camp and they live here now and, and they're successful musicians, you know, and it's, and these are people I consider my closest friends and my family and my home base. And there it's all because of Paul. We all are connected because of Paul. There's probably like dozens of us that are all connected through Paul Carr. And uh, it's a really incredible little network. It's not even a little network. It's a, it's a big network.
being a mentor mm. to a young student uh, is incredible. And I can speak that because he was a mentor and was a great teacher to me. When I, you know, when I met Paul, I was getting uh, an undergrad degree in classical <laughs> trumpet. And then I went on to get my master's degree in classical trumpet. And halfway through that degree, um, I wanted to play jazz. It's a long story, but I wanted to play jazz. And um, uh, Kenny Barron was showing me some things and he said, hey man, the only way you're gonna learn how to play jazz is to do it regularly. And and so I remember going to hear Paul. So I just called Paul Carr up and I said, hey, uh, if you know of any jam sessions, I wanna start to play some jazz. And he said, sure. So he goes, I'm gonna be starting one in about a month at Tacoma Station. So I, I, uh, I said, man, can I come do it? So every Tuesday night, I'd take the train to, uh, to DC. I'd stay at Paul's house and I'd go to the club and play with him, you know, doing this jam session. And it was really rough. And, you know, <clears throat> at first he was like, Terrell, you gotta learn some tunes. You know, you don't know enough tunes. You gotta learn how to, you know, some vocabulary. You know, you have a decent sound since I came from the classical thing, because but you got to get your your feel together, your vocabulary together. And so it was great. So every week he played these tunes. If I didn't know him, I'd write them down. He'd tell me, you know, the records I could find them on. I'd go listen to the records. I'd learn this. Uh, you know, and some mornings, you know, I, I, I remember one day I overslept and uh, he knocked on the door. He goes, man, you got to you got to wake up. He goes, you should have been up an hour ago shedding. Because you sounded sad last night, you know, you got to work on your two fives through the keys. That's what I want you to focus on this week. So I got up and uh, he took me to the train station. That. And, you know, he was, it was, it was an incredible time. I met Tim Warfield officially during that time, but every week playing with Paul Gar was, was, I mean, he's, he was a mentor and still is to me. And every week was a lesson. You know, if I played a tune, I'm like, man, I don't understand how to play this tune. He would explain it to me or he'd tell me what record to go check out. So I can speak firsthand of him being a great mentor and being just an incredible educator. Yeah. Um, through Paul, I met Bobby Watson. And through meeting Bobby Watson is how my whole career really began nationally and internationally because Bobby took me around. And Bobby did introduce me to Art Blakey. And Bobby would tell me, uh, you know, when I joined his band that, um, you know, what I'm going to show you are, are the things that Art Blakey taught me and, and showed me. And I'm going to leave it up to you to show the next generation, however that may be. And I think that's kind of the message that Paul and I received, you know, um, what was shared with us, um, we had to find a way to share it with those, um, the next generation. So what's interesting is that, yeah, you're right, you know, with Art Blakey and Horace Silver, they're out on the road all the time. When I was with Bobby Watson, I was out on the road all the time. Uh, and then that kind of changed. And when it did change, um, you know, more performers be start, be started to become educators, uh, not because they needed to, it was because they wanted to. It was a mission that was given. Um, so I, I think the role of education now is fulfilling the role of the Art Blakey's and the Horace Silver's and the Bobby Watson's, because there may not be as many huge tours, but there's still many opportunities to play. Um, and there's still, you know, as an educator, I want to find as many ways to expose the students to as much as possible as I was exposed. So I think that's the mission of educators now, not only not only to, to teach the students the lessons that we learn from the jazz masters, but also give them opportunities to play and to perform and to, to be heard. Oh, I love the Mid-Atlantic Jazz Festival. You know, uh, I grew up in the area, I grew up in Silver Spring. I, I went to high school there, Paint Branch High School. And um, through college, I know uh, Ronnie Wells and Ron Elliston. Uh, used to have a festival before that, which was incredible. And, you know, Paul Carr being the musician that he is and the educator that he is, for him to do a festival means a lot in many, many ways. A, there's always really a strong educational component at his festival, which is, you know, incredible. B, um, their bands that come together, you know, he he has the show, the high school showcase, and it's a competition which is incredible because the bands, you know, anytime you have the word competition, you know, people think, oh, it's this band against this band. But the way I look at it in some ways that competition really gets the bands to prepare on a whole different level. So the bands come to prepare, they prepare it on a high level and they play at this festival and it's a community, the bands listen to one another. Um, and then the bands have the opportunity, the young people have the opportunity to go and listen to the professional musicians. Um, and that's what it should be about. I mean. You know, Paul's building an audience. He's nurturing an audience. 
and he's um, and he's appeasing an audience. He's pleasing the, the community by bringing in great musicians, but he's also making sure that the younger musicians are listening to what's out there and hopefully inspiring to be there. from the Mid-Atlantic Jazz Festival. That, yeah, that's from, yes. I was going to say that's from that's from the first year. That's yeah. that's from, that's from the first year with Mulgrew Miller and Lewis Nash and Michael Boyd playing uh, uh playing bass. That's from 2000 the, the the very first year. Uh you, you played so many clips. I I I just I if I could just take a second just to respond to j just the thing about Bruce is I wouldn't dare say anything to him about uh, his playing. Be, uh, or, or, or the reason, the reason why you 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 if, if you're blessed to have Bruce Barth to play with you, you just give him the music, you know. And I just love that about it because it's always going to be better than what you than what you thought it was going to be, you know, you know, or, or whatever you you know, you whatever whatever you had in your mind. It, it's always going to be better. It's, it's, I've, I've just never been around someone so flexible and so, and, and so, uh, uh, just so competent and just so, I mean, it, it, it's just, it, it, after I, it's the, I haven't told Bruce this, yet, but a lot of times when I play a solo, I'm li then I listen to him and I'm hearing all of this stuff that I could have played. <laughs> no, Paul, no, Paul, I mean, you know, can, can I add one, interject one thing? You're just you're used to your own stuff. I'm here, no, you know you're used to it. So maybe I'm playing some different stuff. But I'm hearing you play things, and I say, "Why don't I think?" And I'll add one thing, Paul. Your energy on the bandstand. You come to play. You bring the fire, and I love that. So if I play well behind you or with you, it's or after you, it's I get. I get a lot of nourishment from well, you. You you had you had him sing, you had him dancing in the aisles the other week in Baltimore, a couple of weeks ago in Baltimore. That was that was a lot of fun. And I want to uh, about about Angel. Angel is uh, she's very motivated. She's always been very motivated from the from from day one and very interested. And she uh, like I said, she was our you know uh, a first scholarship uh, awardee and so hap um, uh, happy about that. But Angel has taught herself bass. In addition to being a wonderful saxophone player, and she has all of these, all of these, uh, all of these offers to go to, you know, these different colleges and stuff. So a lot of times when the parents say, you know, they say to me, "Oh, she got an offer to this, or she can go to this," I, I'm not really excited because I, I, I'm, I'm actually expecting all of this. You know what I'm saying? So, but she threw me a loop when she learned bass. I have to admit, she she taught herself bass, and then after she taught herself bass, she went and got her some lessons. And so she she's a quite a, a remarkable uh, uh, young musician, and you're gonna hear you're gonna hear from her, you know, um, uh, very soon. And uh, I just want to transition over to the Anderson Twins. They actually played Cherokee on their audition tape 
for Juilliard. So, uh, and I worked with them on uh, uh, on that. And we every time, every every week, we would play Cherokee, and all we just run through the all keys. Uh, Angel knows this. So we play Cherokee in all keys. I mean, as soon as you, soon as soon as you, soon as your, you know, your, your backside hit the chair, boom, Cherokee, let's go. All, you know, all twelve keys, all the time. So, um, and uh, yeah, they, they they played it on their on their um, with, uh, with NASA Avenue playing drums. They played it on their um, uh, their mission tape in, in into Juilliard. Uh, so uh, that and uh, Aaron. Aaron is is something you know. Aaron is right. I as Angel will uh, uh, attest. I do give the drummers a hard time at at rehearsal. I do because I mean that you know uh, drummers like to, especially you know in in high school, they like to entertain themselves, you know, instead of actually playing with the band. So uh, I used to give Aaron a lot of grief. Uh, but I use him as an example all the time as to how how much he worked and he stuck with it. He could have he could have quit several times, uh, but uh, he he wanted it, and um, and, um, and 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 look at the results. But you know, uh, he's he's one of the most in demand drummers in um, you know in, in New York City now. So, yeah, but he yeah yeah I used to I he's right. I did used to give him a lot a lot a lot of grief. <laughs> Well, I think what anyone who's watching this program and listening to what's happening tonight is that Paul Carr is producing an incredible legacy, not only with his own music, with the students that he works with, but also with the Mid-Atlantic Jazz Festival. And when I see someone like a young woman like Angel in the house here, it gives me hope that there is a future for creativity and for young people wanting to be involved in this. Angel, do you see yourself working professionally as a jazz musician? Uh, yes. Um, specifically, like this year, um, I got with a few of the other like jazz academy uh, people, Hudson and Min, uh, piano and drum players, amazing. Um, we started this summer, actually during camp, we started doing uh, street performing. And after that, I just, my motivation just increased. And now I'm really thinking about like the future and like how much I want to uh, spread just music and love and sound uh, through the thing that I love so much and just spreads others. Beautiful, beautiful. Let's close out here with a, a bit of a commercial. Coming up in just a few weeks is this event that we've been talking about. You know, I've been to jazz festivals all over the world. I've been to the North Sea Jazz Festival. I've been to Newport, I've been to Monterey, but there's something really special about the Mid-Atlantic Jazz Festival, and that's the sense of community there. It's held in a hotel in Silver Springs, Maryland over President's Day weekend, and uh, Paul and his lovely wife, Karen, produced a really incredible event where students and musicians come together, and the general public gets to come in there and be part of it as well. Paul, what's going to be happening at the festival this year? Well, this year, believe it or not, is going to be our 14th year. So, uh, th and our theme is all shapes and all hues. We've, uh, Brett, I remember when you came back when we started, we was, uh, it was like the keeper of real jazz. So we've expanded a little bit to, 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 to add some different hues and some different shapes and colors of, of jazz, uh, uh, you know, uh, this year. So we 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 uh, so we have uh, I would say a headliner is a Randy Brecker. We have Kurt Whalem, uh saxophonist. Uh, we are doing a tribute to uh, the great Roy Hargrove with members from his band, and we're actually going to show. We're going to have several uh, uh, screenings of the uh, of the movie Hargrove. We have the great Joe Locke and vocalist Kenny Washington, and. Uh, uh, we teamed up with the with the uh, DC Jazz Festival, and their Grand Prix renter um, is is actually going to open the festival. Uh, uh, a female uh, tenor saxophonist, from, I think she's from, I'm going to say South America. I want to say Chile, but I could be wrong. Uh, Juliet uh, Ingenio, uh, Argentina. She, Argentina. Okay, right. Yeah, uh, a great player. I actually happened to catch a little bit of her set at the DC Jazz Festival. So. Uh, wasn't surprised that she, you know, that she turned out to be the winner. And we have this fabulous uh, uh, vocalist, um, um, uh, 
Ashley Perzotti featuring Joel Fromm. But her, and, um, her, she, she's she's incredible, and um, and um, so that that they they're actually I think they're playing Saturday night, and then we're gonna have a Texas tenor, um, uh, the Texas tenor, what is this called? Uh, Titans. So it's gonna be Kurt Whalem, uh, Walter Smith the third, and myself. Now Kurt is actually from Memphis. But he's, uh, I met him at Texas Southern when he was going to, uh, going to school there. So he's a, he's, um, he, he was uh, maybe a year or two, probably two years uh, ahead of me. But I met him at the high school festival there at uh, Texas Southern. And he actually uh, encouraged me to come to Texas Southern. So, uh, so, so he spent a, a fair amount of time. Uh, that's actually, you know, where he, where he, to me, where he really gained his voice when he was, uh, when he was in Texas. So. So we're gonna do a, a three tenor um, uh, Texas Titans type of uh, a set, and uh, and we have another set uh, with um, with uh, we call it the Scat Summit Vocal Summit with Ashley Prezodi again, um, uh, great international. Uh, uh, she happens to live here, but she's uh, she tours the world. Sharon Clark, and same with uh, Christy DeShield. They 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 live in the area, but they but they tour the world. So that's going to be three singers, and that's going to uh, be calling that the Scat Summit. Uh, watch out for that. Uh, so uh, I don't know why I scheduled myself to go behind them. <laughs> <laughs> with my with my group, it's called the uh, Paul Carr Collective, uh, featuring Alan Johnson, uh, Paul Ballenbeck, uh, Her uh, Herlin Raleigh from New mm -hmm. Orleans. Um, uh, really looking forward to uh, playing with him again, and and uh, William Ledbetter, Mo Better bass from uh, he's from North Carolina. Uh, it sounds like he grew up uh, playing uh, in the church, and then all of a sudden he went to jazz school. But uh, he's he's incredible, uh, a bass player. And we have our college uh, ensembles doing the uh, matinees. So West Virginia with Joe Locke is going to play, and we have uh, the the Peabody Institute uh, conductor uh, Sean Jones. Uh, Jared Sims is the conductor for uh, West uh, West Virginia, but. Uh, but Peabody will be uh, uh, their, their special guest will be uh, Walter Smith the third, and uh, the Jazz Academy is also playing on the matinee, and I will uh, with Randy Brecker, and uh, East Carolina uh, is uh, uh, is also playing, and uh, with um, uh, Ada Rivoti on uh, on tenor saxophone, and then we have uh, uh, Fran uh, Velma, his orchestra. Is an, so uh, so so the during the during the um, matinees we have big bands so the so the kids uh, that are in the high school you know competition they can come over and hear and hear a big band you know and so and the college uh, students so that uh, get to play with the pros so it's uh, and we have a, a, a just a you know the clinics and the um, uh, in the interviews, and we have, uh, uh, you know, we have a, a top, uh, you know, we have panel discussions, and also our three um, uh, service award winners uh, this year is Mr. Todd Barkin of uh, of Keystone uh, uh, Corner, uh, uh, a fabulous educator from Maryland, uh, Ron Kearns, and Mama D. Uh, and if anybody has ever gone to any jazz festival in the last 25 years you've seen mama d working in the green room so we're gonna honor we're gonna honor her and uh mr ron kearns and todd barkin for their for their career in in jazz so we it's a it's a it's a it's a weekend uh i call it a, a jazz cruise on land you know it's just everything is you know we just you know you 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 don't need to check in uh as uh, soon as you check in you don't need to leave and we have swing dancing, we have line dancing, we we just have every we just have a good time, you know. Uh, so uh, and you can and you can find us at www.midatlanticjazzfestival.org. I want to thank everyone who joined us tonight, both uh, on tape and live. Uh, I hope that uh, our viewers have gotten some sense of the importance of Paul Carr's mission and what an excellent job he's doing in fulfilling it. You know, we're surrounded today by a lot of negativity in this world. You can't 
turn on the television or get on social media or, or read something, and most of it is bad news. This is going to show good news. Yes. There are people like Paul Carr out there. There are musicians like Bruce Barth. There are young students like Angel McCray who are doing something positive, bringing some beauty into this world. So I think we need to celebrate that. Thanks so much and look forward to seeing you next time on Sunday Night Live.